Hello, everyone. I'm John Lin, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to be talking about remote patient monitoring today. And our guest is Josh Clayman. He's CEO of Remedy. Welcome, Josh. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So before we dive into remote patient monitoring, tell us a little bit about yourself and Remedy. Sure. I'm, I have been in technology for decades now. Um, with uh, mostly IT infrastructure and data analytics. Started a long time ago with NCR and then went to uh, AT&T and then, and then Dell for 10 years as an executive wow. there. Um, and then went to increasingly smaller mid cap companies around 3D printing, advertising technology, et cetera. I was always sort of drawn into healthcare and public sector businesses, healthcare education. Um, I found it easy to be seduced into these these sort of sectors. They're more solution oriented. They were more their people were more mission driven, et cetera. So I'm really happy to be back here. I've been with Remedy for three years now, um, and it's been a really fun journey. Yeah, I can imagine remote patient monitoring is one of the most exciting, interesting, uh, evolving spaces of healthcare. And one of the things that I think is interesting about remote patient monitoring is we're starting to see a bit of market differentiation with some companies focusing solely on like a very specific disease or condition. And we see others saying, hey, we're going to do all the remote patient monitoring. How do you think that should happen? Should we focus just on specific diseases? Should we have a full platform? You know, how is Remedy approaching it? (laughs) Well, I'll I'll tell you how we're approaching it and then maybe discuss the a broader issue because I think sure. it's still a question mark, but there are some things on both sides of the ledger that I think would be worth um, getting into. We have decided that we want to be a platform play, and we started with diabetes and with glucometers, and then we spread to heart failure and CBD and hypertension control and obesity and on and on and on. The reason we did that was client feedback. Um, And the client feedback typically stemmed from sort of what we've been calling just recently sort of point solution fatigue. Mm. You know, they have to get everything approved. If they have one specific solution, doesn't matter if it's just very, very um, sort of specific. They still have to go through the approval process with the audits and security and HIPAA compliance, et cetera, which is a burden to bear. So um, the other issue though, which is very much from a healthcare delivery perspective relevant, is that a lot of these chronic conditions that we started with um, are comorbid states. So, you know, 60% of type two diabetics have two or three other um, uh, chronic conditions, you know, CBD, hypertension, et cetera. So it doesn't really make much sense to parse them with technology or to parse them with specific practices. It makes more sense to look at them as a holistic patient. It's easier for the provider and better for the patient. So that's kind of our approach. That's what, that's what our approach has been. And I think it's being validated in the market. Now, interestingly, um, it's almost um, a new I mean, I think RPM started as a very, very specific thing, right? One yeah. disease state, one device. Definitely. Then it spread out, and now we're seeing more complex, more sophisticated devices around, for example, cardiology mm-hmm. or around neurology, brain health, et cetera. Um, and those are very um, specific practices, very specific clinical pathways, and very specific technology. So what we're grappling with now, and I think we're solving it, is can we still be a platform play, but attach specific technologies and configure our our kind of functional building blocks of our platform around very specific use cases? And so far, we're having quite a bit of luck doing that. Yeah, I think that's what's so fascinating. I compare it to the EHR world, which is where I started, where every hospital was buying best of breed, the best lab system, the best R, you know, pharmacy system, the best EHR. And yeah. then they finally said, wait, why are we doing this? I, I love your, uh, you know, point solution fatigue. And it's a great description. Yeah. <laughs> they said, no, we need one. It's called Epic or Cerner. <laughs> it needs to do everything. And I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's like, are we going to go through that same process in RPM? Because many of the RPM solutions didn't have everything, right? So they 
they almost have to be best of breed right now, even though they don't want to be. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? Or I think there are a lot of analogs in other economic sectors where you have this sort of best of breed versus platform play. Uh-huh. And, um, and, and where good enough is maybe good enough if you have a platform because you have other benefits coming from that. Um, I think the platform play is going to win out. And um, the reason is, again, this sort of new focus on value-based care, on taking care of the whole patient. And what we see out there is this incredible fragmentation in innovation in healthcare. Mm. You know, it, it's a, it's, it is a unique sector. There's just no two ways around that. And you have these sort of dominant players in EHRs, you have dominant players in health systems, you have dominant players in payers, in the payer community. And then underneath it all, you have all these little innovative companies saying, hey, we want to fix healthcare. And it leads to the sort of this fragmented approach. What we've tried to do at Remedy, and I know some others are trying to do too, is say, no, let's fight against that urge to further fragment and become just a best of breed point solution and start bringing these pieces together. Um, You know, we've done that in other ways. You know, we really very rarely refer ourselves as a pure RPM platform. Sure. It's one feature of our platform, but our mission is really to sort of blur this line between in-clinic episodic care and virtual continuous care, adding clinical pathways, adding clinical decision support. And why do we want to do that? Because we believe that's the better way of delivering healthcare to the majority of people. So it's not about an RPM reimbursement stream. It's not about diabetes management. It's about, I think in five or 10 years, you're going to see everyone monitored yeah. um, for perioperative care, you know, pre and post operative care for chronic disease, for preventative measures before chronic disease is actually diagnosed, you know, pre-diabetes, et cetera. So I don't think anyone's not going to be monitored in five or 10 years. And the costs are going to go down because of that. The quality of engagement is going to go up and the, and the outcomes are going to improve. That's, that's a, it's, you can tell it's a strong conviction of ours that we're at the yeah. beginning of a real revolution. So RPM kind of, I don't know, sort of compartmentalizes it in a way that makes us squirm a little bit, <laughs> as does clinical decision support as a standalone sure. product, right? Absolutely. And, and I want to dive into some of those aspects. Uh, just one more thing on this topic, though, because I think to your point, if we were designing the perfect solution to monitor patients, right. whether remotely or in, in hospital or wherever it might be, it, it would be one system, right? We wouldn't have point solutions, right? We wouldn't right. have, you know, the closest I could come is actually like prenatal, you know, and, and you know, birthing a child. Maybe mm-hmm. there's an episodic case there that'd be made for something. Mm-hmm. But even then, you know, like they probably have other conditions that they need to manage right. as well. So, uh, you know, but it's like when you look at that, but then you also have in the hospital, each department is over cardiac versus respiratory. So it takes a a real visionary CIO to fight against them and say, no, we want to use a platform. We don't want to have 30 solutions that are all causing us misery, right? (laughs) I I, I think you're bringing up a great point. This, um, it's not just, um, you know, this behavior is sort of institutionalized in the ecosystem of healthcare. Yep. And um, what we typically find is that instead of fighting that, you know, no, buy a platform, buy a platform, we typically find a clinical advocate. And if that's a cardiologist, great. If it's a head of a metabolic or disease management center, that's fantastic too. We get in the door and then everyone looks over their shoulder and sort of says, hey, what are you doing there? Oh, is that about patient engagement? Oh my goodness, you're using pathways effectively. Um, you're communicating with the patient, they're doing their own readings and they're really adhering. Well, we need some of that. And so yeah. then we expand in that account with other use cases. Yeah. But our platform allows us to do that because we're not overly focused. But it is interesting. Um, the clinical advocates we have are almost always are not CIOs. Mm-hmm. They're almost always advocates that within a department who have some sort of latent frustration with the current clinical workflow. So it is interesting. 
Right. And I always say, what's the gateway drug, right? You know, <laughs> it's usually some clinical advocate that says, I need to solve this problem. And then they expand. So this is a common, right. common approach. Well, let's shift gears a little and talk, you know, uh, we can't have a conversation without talking about the pandemic, right? So <laughs> what's been your perspective on how kind of this space of remote patient monitoring the work you're doing? How has it been impacted by the pandemic? Well, we as a company have been impacted pretty dramatically. Um, you know, initially we responded um, to the need for remote triage, remote surveillance of patients that are self-isolating, et cetera. And then gradually to have you, have you had a test? What was that result? When's your last test? And then finally, just recently to vaccinations. So tracking vaccinations, that all became kind of what we call our epidemic uh, module. Okay. And we've now integrated that into our platform. But the bigger, um, you know, uh, change to our business is just this, you know, burning platform or impetus to get into RPM. And, you know, we, RPM has been growing for a while. Yep. Um, but for RPM players, it's been a frustrating road, right? It's taken a for certain sure. amount of tenacity. And the reason is long sell cycle, a lot of discussion, a lot of buy-in, um, from what I would call sort of impotent advocates, you hmm. know, people who kind of, wow, this is exactly what medicine should look like. This is right. exactly how we want to take care of that high risk cohort of patients, but I can't get anyone to buy in. There's no budget for it, that sort of thing. So Such a good description. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of feel good meetings that led nowhere. And suddenly with COVID, they led somewhere because you had the C-suite of the hospital say, we are losing touch with these high risk patients. That's a concern. And we're also losing, we also have revenue and financial shortfalls. Jeez. You know, our elective procedures have, have basically gone to zero. So we need to look creatively at alternative revenue streams. And that's where the clarity around the reimbursement codes has, has helped as well. So it's been a convergence of factors, but we don't think that's a bump, right? We don't think that's, that genie is going to get back in the bottle. We just think, this, this um, sort of spur, this sort of higher velocity of adoption by maybe five or 10 years, compressed adoption timeframes. And, and again, a lot of sectors have some crisis or some event that does compress technology adoption timeframes. And I think that's what we've seen here. Yeah. So it's been well, good for this, you know, it's kind of given a silver lining, I guess, to the COVID crisis. Yeah, we got to take every, uh, benefit and plus we can find right, right. <laughs> silver right. lining as they say um it, it's interesting you mentioned the reimbursement and you know those codes were put in place well before covid which was good i, I imagine how it would have been without those codes right. but it's still i think somewhat challenging because some of the more advanced stuff well, first, I don't think they pay a lot, but I'd love to hear your perspective on that. But, you know, but also they don't pay for everything that you could do and that, you know, a healthcare organization would want to do. But what would you like to see happen with RPM reimbursement and, and really kind of this whole area of proactively, you know, taking care of a patient's wellness rather than treating a condition? So um, let me start with the last question first. So I think mm -hmm. Remote, let's not say RPM, but let's say remote patient engagement um, mm -hmm. because it's multifaceted and, and our platform takes care of many of these facets. So it's providing digital education, real time and monitoring how they're getting through that. So you can, you can play with content, play with sort of the, 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 the type of media you send to a patient. Um, it's communicating with that patient. It's, it's not just monitoring their glucose or their blood pressure. It's communicating with them in a way that motivates them to actually do their readings and actually adhere to their, their therapy plans, et cetera. Um, by, they know Sally is there. They see Sally periodically and Sally's texting them and saying, hey, well done, or haven't seen a reading in a couple of days. Is everything okay? That's, that creates these little bite sizes of motivation, right? These little, these little interactions, which are powerful. And we've seen adherence to programs because of that. Mm. Pure programs that are purely driven by algorithms, you see alert fatigue, you see drop off and attrition from those programs. You need to scale human touch through technology, but you need the human touch. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of number one. Um, 
I think that a lot of the first, there's a lot of operative use cases and we could talk about it a couple of ours, but chronic disease management, right? RPM around these, these chronic states is kind of goal number one. You know, you know the, the epidemic of diabetes and these other cardiometabolic diseases is, continues to, to grow, but also the secondary management and prevention of those diseases does not, the needle hasn't moved at all. We're doing as bad a job now as we did 20 years ago, except there's more patients. Right. RPM has shown, there's a growing body of, of empirical evidence that RPM and this remote patient engagement can reduce glucose levels and can get blood pressure under control, et cetera. But these diseases skew toward underserved populations. So when we think about what we want to do, what we want to have institutionalized by CMS and, and then follow on by commercial payers, we want to have legislation which, which suspends co-pays indefinitely. Mm -hmm. They've been suspended for this health emergency. We need to have that done because even a $10 copay if you're deciding between a copay for that or buying groceries, guess what you're going to decide, right? Yeah, or buying you gas. Buy the groceries. <laughs> right, exactly. So um, the, um, the other thing is we have a, a millions of Americans, somewhere between 35 and 40 million Americans that are covered by FQHCs and rural health clinics. Right now, there's no real reimbursement framework for them for RPM. These are the most vulnerable populations who have a range of social determinant issues to deal with. Their car is broken down, they're working two jobs and have three kids at home. Um, they're probably very motivated to take care of themselves but find it an impossible task and we're not making it easier. So that's where you see the real magic of this remote patient engagement combined with telehealth visits sure. um, that you see a real impact on these populations. So we would like to see the government figure out how we can sustain reimbursement frameworks for FQHCs and rural health clinics as well. Great idea. And I, I, you know, I think if I was a doctor listening to this discussion right now, I'd be like, man, how do I fit that in my day? But I, you know, it's a, and I think when I talk to people like this, I'm like, it's often not the doctor. How do you see that kind of playing out? Who's going to manage this engagement? Really, it's an engagement platform. At the end of the day, is it you know a doctor? Is it a care manager, case manager, nurse? You know, what what are the roles that each of them play in this effort? Yeah. Well, we've learned so much, you know, over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, we thought the doctors were going to use this, and now in retrospect, it seems like such a naive view of the world, right? Yeah. Um, we see emerging uh, sort of emerging best practices that are centralized. Mm -hmm. So you have a small central staff and you can, again, scale this dramatically. You can have three or four people that manage hundreds of patients um, because, and we can get, come back to this, we, we let the technology do a lot of the alerting, the filtering that, hey, mm -hmm. move your eyes over here. This patient needs a phone call or move your eyes over here. This patient has a is has had three episodes of hypoglycemia this week we need to do something in terms of therapy adjustment so we need to again that's what i mean by scaling the human touch with the technology you need to filter it and alert etc um, but when we do that we can have three four five people we have one health system with you know 35 people centrally monitoring this and then they collaborate with the providers they collaborate with the doctors and say we're seeing a pattern here that concerns us. I want you to look at their chart and they, 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 you know, they export a report from our platform into the EHR and the doctor looks at the chart and reviews the chart and says, oh, we should move them to mealtime insulin or we should get them on sure. another hypertensive drug, et cetera. So we see that being a very, very successful model. The other model we see is that even with central um, um, organizations, it's a big change management project you know it, it's people say well rpm is growing but it seems to be a kind of a wrestling match out there still and the reason <laughs> for that is it's really a change management program we're fundamentally changing how healthcare is being delivered it's not just plug this technology in and you're you're ready to go but to make it easier we see a lot of um kind of third party what we, we call them rpm administrators 
third party organizations that use our technology to underpin the service and connect with the EHRs, et cetera, and monitor the patients, but they do it for those doctors. So the doctors really have to do nothing except give them a cohort of patients to monitor. And then they, they enroll the patients, they give them the devices, they train them and they monitor them. And only when it calls for an alert of, or therapy adjustment or a consultation, do they get the doctor involved? So the, the doctor, it's a win-win for them. They get some revenue in, they don't have to worry about change control. So we see that as an emerging model as well, whether it's in-house or outsourced. That's a fascinating model. And I think to your point, the thing that I look at with RPM in general and behavior change, if you will, which, you know, in this new mode of approaching patients is it's complicated. <laughs> I think it's more complicated than most people realize because there's just so many things at work. You have to collect the right data. You have to identify the right patients. You have to analyze that data to know how that's impacting the patient. You have to communicate with the patient in an effective way that doesn't actually make them worse, which is what I hate yeah. about some platforms, right? <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm just going to send them a text message. It's like, well, that text message, if they can't pay for the drug, actually just makes things worse. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And then, you know, let's, let's not even talk about behavior change, right? So, you know, what do you see? Uh, how are you approaching this kind of comprehensive, challenging problem? And what, what are some of the steps you've taken to address the challenge? Well, one, I think we do have a multifaceted approach, right? So we're not just monitoring and, you know, irritating patients with that. We're right. communicating, we're educating them, you know, you know, why are you on a new drug? Why, mm -hmm. why did the doctor put you? Why are we asking you to, to, you know, step on or off a scale twice a day? Why are we even asking you to do that? Uh -huh. Yeah, you had your 10 minute consultation with your doctor, but did it sink in? Did you internalize any of that? Right. Um, and how do we remind you to do that now, without a scolding tone, right? Without alert fatigue, how do we kind of gradually remind you to do that? And, and you see the benefits through positive reinforcement, you know, well done, mm -hmm. you know, hey, we have some good data on you. We're going we're gonna to maybe, maybe make a change to your treatment plan because of it, or hey, well done on losing that weight or whatever the case, right? Um, the other thing that I mentioned, you need human interaction humans, the motivation, you know, people have described these wellness platforms that are purely technology driven as just scolding mothers on their shoulder. You know, <laughs> it's like, take your glucose test, take your, oh, you're out of range, you're out of range, you know, my goodness. And, yeah. and they just turn it off after a while because it demotivates and causes anxiety. Um, yeah, let's not talk fact, about BMI, right? We're, we're, we're all obese, basically. <laughs> especially, that's one downside of the COVID crisis. I, I self-isolated <laughs> yeah, and, and, and snapped a lot. <laughs> um, but I, I do think that um, the other thing is to have sort of a qualitative feedback loop, right? And we trigger surveys, you know, patient-reported outcome, we, you know, anxiety, do you want to talk to someone? Are you feeling anxious about the management of your disease? Do you have any questions? Do you have a food source, right? Do you, do you need food? Do you, so we can weave that in very nicely with this kind of more holistic um, sort of method or framework for remote patient engagement. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, having said all that, it's hard because we are trying to change behavior to an extent, but we're trying to change provider behavior as well and this sort of clinical inertia, which then became kind of a cultural inertia, you know, it's a hard thing to crack. And, and we're just doing it, you know, one client at a time, one cohort of patients at a time. We, uniformly, we're seeing positive results, which then people loosen up and say, hey, let's do more of it. Let's get more in a, innovative with this approach. So I think it will come. And I mean, I think the, the data says it's, it's, it's growing very quickly. What we're really terrified with, and I think you're hitting on this to an extent, is, is there a backlash? Is there going to be, well, that didn't work. <laughs> there so often is in healthcare. So we're, we're capturing the data. We're, we're capturing the interactions with patients. We're correlating that with better outcomes. And so far, we're seeing nothing but, but, but goodness out of it. Yeah. That's great. And I love how you talked about the technology aspect, but also the human connection aspect, which I think is important. But looking at the technology side of things, you know, it's one thing to send to people a bunch of devices and sensors that, you know, 
blood pressure cuffs, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, do you, how do you see that playing out versus kind of a pure technology play, which is kind of more of the, you know, are you stressed today? How are you feeling? You know, the, you kind of talked about from the mental health side of things. How do you see that evolving? Do you think sensors are going to just keep exploding or, you know, I love the idea of invisibles, like my cell phone does all of it. And, uh, you know, cause of course I'm going to be holding my cell phone. But what do you see playing out there as far as your efforts between devices or communication, et cetera? I, um, so I'll, I'll state a little bit more strongly, probably, which is, I think we're going to look back in a very few years, maybe three years, mm -hmm. and look at the blood pressure cuffs. And we have a strong view on Bluetooth versus cellular and all that stuff, sure. right? But, and basically, just a footnote that, that is, whatever makes the technology more invisible to the patient is the bet, right technology. So right? you like cellular, got it. We like cellular. <laughs> We still so you with Bluetooth, but it never it never ends well. Um, cellular is seamless; the data magically flows into our platform, etc. But these cellular devices, the blood pressure cuffs, the glucometers, etc., we're going to look back and say, "What a bunch of clunky technology that was!" You know, we're it, it's um, it's you know, it's it's one time use. It's really not continuous. It's multiple points, maybe in a day or in a week. Um, it's not wearable. It's not multifaceted. So we're definitely going to go to wearables or, or, you know, there's some really interesting, which you're, I'm sure, immersed in, but some very interesting photographic technology, which yeah. can measure blood pressure, et cetera, and stress levels and pulse rate and eventually, you know, um, some other um, pulse ox even today. Yep. But a watch that measures glucose and blood pressure and EKGs, et cetera, is going to be interesting. I will say, though, that... And I think that's what's going to take over. We don't care. We're an informatics platform. The better the data, our challenge is then just to visualize it in a way that providers can ingest it and create actions on it. So data in itself, there's plenty of data in the clinical workflow. It's making it useful and visualizing it in an intuitive way that's important. That's what our platform does today. And we'll continue to push the envelope on that. But the, 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 um, the, the, um, the interesting thing is that when you have watches that do glucose and pulse and blood pressure, cardiologists are going to say, no, I want a six lead EKG mm -hmm. and I want to connect with that. So you're always going to have this sort of bifurcation between implantable or very, very technical and, and comprehensive, but specific monitoring versus sort of wearables or invisibles that this sort of monitor big swaths of the population. Um, but I, I think they're both gonna coexist for a while, for probably a long time. Um, but the clunky devices we have today, including pricking fingers, and I mean, it just seems, <laughs> seems barbaric almost, doesn't it? I think all that's gonna be gone before, way before most people predict it's gonna be gone. Yeah, I've seen some of the technology and I mean, just staring at a camera for the last whatever 20 minutes that we've been talking, it's like it could, it could have been monitoring my yes. heart rate this whole time. It could have been monitoring my stress levels. It could have been monitoring all sorts of things. And absolutely, I, mean, I guess if we're going to do Zoom well. calls all day, we might as well make them useful. Is that <laughs> <laughs> right. And that gets into all kinds of, you know, you got to stay with HIPAA compliance, who's sure. monitoring the data. But that's really not the technical challenge here. You know, that's wow. a, that's a societal challenge. It's a moral one. It's not a technical challenge to kind of create walls around that, that, that information. I agree. And, and I agree completely. I think the, the, the wearables we have today are not medically relevant, largely a uh, few exceptions, but, mm -hmm. and, but they're going to be very soon, I think. And that's, yeah. that's exciting. Well, I, I couldn't do an interview. I mean, as the EHR guy, I mean, I've been known as the EHR guy for 15 years. <laughs> so I, I have to talk a little bit about that before we wrap up. And, you know, you guys have taken an interesting approach. You know, really, I think it's, you know, this is my gut. And you tell me if I, I read it wrong, on you know, reviewing uh, your company, but you've, you've made a big bet on smart on fire. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd love to hear, you know, how are you taking your approach to EHR integration, your work with smart on fire, and really kind of that question is fire enough. I'd love to hear what you think there, uh, since you've obviously done a lot of work there. So we made a big bet and an early bet on fire. Um, we were, I think, one of the first out of the gates. Um, and 
almost obscenely early. You know, we talk mm-hmm. to people about fire and they say, what's fire? You know, my EHR doesn't have a fire API. <laughs> um, but we made the right bet. And that was our founder, Lucy Ide, who even before I came in the company, made that bet. And I think she made the right one. We also made a bet around just generally data interoperability. It's, I think the government, the ONC, are going to continue to push that case. And I think they're going to continue to um, pretty severely slap the hands of VHR vendors who are not abiding by the rules, which today is the vast majority, right, are in one way or another trying to block data. They, they're trying to make it very hard. Right. Um, so, and that's just, I hope that's not too controversial to say, it's just kind of a fact of our life right now. Um, yeah, I would describe it as uh, some are proactive and some are just ignorant to it. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's completely fair. I think that's a completely fair characterization. Um, but there are very few that are proactively saying, we're going to embrace interoperability, we're going to embrace standards, and we're just going to, we believe a partner ecosystem is better for us commercially as well as sort of morally. Um, but and I would throw out one more, their customers sure. aren't asking for it either, right? So in many cases, it's the customers who are the problem as much as the HR vendor, but yeah. <laughs> no, that's, I think that's true. I think it's interesting that the, we need to make a stronger case. And I think the, the ONC, I think the, the, the government largely buys that case, but we need to make a stronger case of why for a patient's well-being, it's important but they don't necessarily care about direct access to all their, their data. You know, I'm offered that through my healthcare provider. I've never once logged onto the portal. I'm like, well, the doctor tells me my lab is off my lab. I mean, it's, it's, it's not something that's a burning need in my life to have more yeah. data thrown at no. me. I describe it, per, you know, that, Sure. Patients 100% should have access to it. It's their right. And, the, you know, that's what the rules are saying. But right. how many really glean value out of access to that data? Yeah. Uh, and it's a small number, right? Uh, uh, either yeah. we're ignorant to it, we don't care enough, whatever. I mean, there's all sorts of societal issues as well. <laughs> there are. The one reason I like the push, though, that you own your own health data is because it emphasizes the point that the hospital doesn't and the EHR doesn't. Mm. So that is a valuable perspective for companies like Remedy, that the, the patient owns that data. The patient can decide where it's shared. Um, and that's, we do like that because it gets it out of the arms of the hospital system who really wants to keep, keep that or the EHR who believes that's sort of their value is keeping that data kind of trapped within them. So I think we need to continue to push on this. And I think it's going to be a, a big, um, a big um, discussion over the next two to three years. I think FIRE is the way to go. And now that payer platforms are adopting FIRE too, I think we're going to see, you know, there's, we think of two big data sets in the healthcare ecosystem, payer data sets and, and sort of more clinical provider data sets. Uh-huh. Both are essential to create a holistic view of that patient, right. but the two very rarely meet. <laughs> <laughs> and fire may be the tunnel which allows us to kind of combine those data sets into a very accurate, actionable view of that patient's life cycle, which is a pretty powerful tool in healthcare. Well, and what's fascinating is if you think about from when even three years ago when you started with the company. Fire was coming, right? But you know, still was you know in the process. But yeah. now. Uh, you know, every healthcare organization knows what fire capabilities right. they have or don't have, or, you know, and certainly there's priorities and challenges there, but you know, they, they all have that capability. So that's right. Uh, I agree. I, th- I think it was a good bet. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Excellent. Well, Josh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you sharing all of these perspectives and insights. It's going to be fun to, to, you know, let's, let's check in as, as things continue to progress and thanks so much for sharing. Thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. It was a pleasure.